welcome. From fast food to finance, if your job uses technology, it's likely you are being watched. Software that tracks workplace performance has quickly become a booming business. The tracking programs leverage big data and electronic devices to track everything a worker does, when, where, and how fast. It can dramatically improve productivity, but at what price to people's privacy and blood pressure? We will get to this fast. My boss is watching. Also on the program, Bolivia. We look back to see how a grassroots movement managed to elect the first indigenous president. Then look forward to Bolivia's future, which involves a key ingredient for electric cars. Then in our public intellectual segment, a scholar will tell us why few millennials want to run for public office. And toward the end of the hour, immigrant women make their voices heard in a unique film series. First, what's been called the gamification of performance management. High-tech firms like Cornerstone providing tracking software to help corporations increase productivity through intense electronic monitoring of employees. It goes way beyond catching you emailing mom on company time. Esther Kaplan's cover story in this month's Harper's Magazine is a cautionary tale entitled The Spy Who Fired Me, The Human Costs of Workplace Monitoring. Do we have to talk fast? <laughs> yes. Yes. More words per minute, Brian. What put you on to this? Well, uh, actually, I uh, got in a conversation with a labor organizer I know who works with uh, UPS drivers through their reform caucus in, in the Teamsters Union, TDU. And I, I said, you know, um, I never get my UPS packages. Even when I'm home, they just slap the delivery notice on the door, and they never seem to ring the bell so that I can come down and sign for the package. And he said, aha. <laughs> I can tell you why this is probably going on. And it's because of this new system called telematics that put incredibly high new productivity quotas on UPS drivers uh, and tracks their every movement. So they basically have to find any way to meet their metrics. Uh, and some Delivering of those Delivering involve... more packages per day than they used to? Uh, way more. So one driver I spoke to, his, he, his stops per day quota, and a stop might have 20 packages, went from 80 a decade ago up to 110 now. So UPS, if you look at their, their SEC filings, during the period they rolled out this telematics system, they increased their domestic package delivery by almost 1.5 million per year with 22,000 fewer domestic employees. Mm. So you're saying that to meet that delivery goal, they wouldn't stay around to ring your bell and wait for you to come out or come down and get your package. They would just slap the sticker on your door which says we attempted to deliver? Well, they've got, the, the, the system now knows where they physically are right. when they sheet a delivery as the, it's the old school word from when you actually wrote it on a sheet. So they, they, they wouldn't be able to just drive by a building and claim they'd attempted a delivery. They'd have to get near the door. Right. But they don't necessarily have to spend that, you know, five minutes waiting for you to walk down your three floor, you know, walk up and, and sign for the package. But there, there's other more dangerous shortcuts. I mean, the, the telematics tests, uh, it can measure whether their seatbelt is buckled. So what I heard is drivers just buckle it behind them and keep it buckled behind them all day so they don't have to waste those extra seconds buckling in and unbuckling as they get in and out of the vehicle. They also don't lift properly. The UPS has a rigid protocol for how you lift so that you don't blow out your back, shoulders yeah. and your back and your knees and they don't do it. And, um, and they get injured. The trucks could be speeding as people try to get from place to place too, which would be another risk. Um, drivers jaywalking to deliver packages. Drivers have been hit and one ended up in a coma. Okay, so, so this is really interesting about UPS, but it's just one example. Yeah. So take us to some other whole really different example of telematics. Well, so telematics is part of what is now called the Internet of, Internet of Things. So this is where it used to be that all computers could process with information we as humans put in. But with the Internet of Things, they're pulling data in from every little radio frequency device or GPS signal or the, 
the electronic system within a vehicle. So they're pulling in this data from all over the place and pulling it into a central database. But there's all kinds of forms of workplace surveillance at work at this point. There's talent management systems among knowledge workers. There's so-called workforce management systems among fast food and retail. There's straight up um, surveillance systems of, say, what websites we're visiting, how many keystrokes we're typing, how many times we're clicking our mouse. Um, the technology has gotten so cheap for all of these devices that all kinds of surveillance is possible now that wasn't even five or six years ago. So one of the things that I found really significant reporting this was that it's really during this period since the financial crash with this super slack labor market where workers have no ability to say no to really anything that these systems have all been developed and implemented with the idea of creating efficiencies, saving management money, and there's been really no pressure from below um, to make these systems less invasive, less damaging to people's bodies and lives. Do workers even know in every case? Are employers required to inform them what kind of telematics they're tracking them with? No. Well, there's two states, but otherwise there's no federal requirement that you be notified you're being surveilled, and, and all but two states have no state regulations. So more or less, and they're very small states, so more or less the answer is no you um, are probably being surveilled and don't know it. Just so I know, which two states? Do you have it? <laughs> it's Connecticut and Delaware, I think. I'll double check that. Okay, so one of, one of them's here in our, in our <laughs> viewing area, in the tri-state yeah. area. Yes. Um, seems like another pace, case of technology outpacing the law in a certain mm -hmm. respect. Has mm -hmm. policy not caught up with this, and could it? Yes, policy could. I mean, it's interesting. While I was reporting this article, the Federal Trade Commission held a series of public forums where they brought together experts from all sorts of fields to examine the question of compilation of consumer data, right? What we, our purchases, what we put up in social media and all that. And there's beginning to be real attention to that. All that information we're handing over to Google and Facebook but this has not even started when it comes to workplace surveillance. There's no, no one's watching the, the store. Who's making money on this? Are there telematics software and hardware production companies? Yeah, so there's this booming third-party business. The telematics business, um, it's, it's a super exploding business. They estimate, the experts I talked with, that it's only at, a, at about 20% adoption. So these Third-party firms like Telegis is one of the leading ones. They contract with Ford and Coca-Cola and really huge firms. Um, it's estimated that it'll be an $11 billion industry mm. within the next couple of years. The workforce management systems, also a multi-billion dollar, fast-growing industry. Now, for the companies themselves, are they getting returns? These systems are super expensive. I mean, if you look at the workforce management systems that are used in retail, um, estimates are it costs between two and four hundred dollars per worker to implement these systems. A big system is well north a million dollars. UPS spent a hundred million in a single year putting its telematic mm. system into place. So, so they you're must may, whether you're getting the return on investment, I, I, I'm not sure. Or if this keeps expanding, then they must be measuring that they're getting so much financially out of surveilling their employees and monitoring and tracking and then I guess segmenting and scheduling their every move um, that it's worth it to them. Well they certainly believe that if they don't do it they're not going to be competitive. Um, to give us another example from your article, Allison Santana, a Pennsylvania mother of four who I think is uh, exemplifying kind of how this has affected people's schedules, right? Yeah, so she's a Starbucks worker, and um, Starbucks has one of these electronic scheduling systems. And uh, what that means, what these systems do, is they pull in all this historical data about how much foot traffic there is at this time of day, this time of year, when it's sunny, when it's raining, and they try to absolutely squeeze out any slack from the work schedule. There's no more, like, hanging around and chatting with your coworkers anymore because if traffic's that slow, you're going to be off the clock. So instead of an eight-hour shift, you're working a four-hour shift just at peak. And then they might try to bring you back for another three or four-hour shift that evening or the next morning. 
And so she was hired at just above minimum wage and was told she'd be getting, you know, 35 hours a week, plus or minus, and she ended up only getting 18 hours a week because all her shifts were these little three or four hour shifts. But she didn't know what they were going to be mm. more than a few days in advance. She had state subsidized daycare, but they required her to notify them of her schedule a week in advance, and she didn't have the week in advance huh. notice at work. So Plus, she, if you're only working that many hours for that wage, you probably yeah. have a second job or a third job, right. and you want to be able to schedule your hours there. Right. So she had a night job at a hotel, and even though her manager knew that at Starbucks, she would get a, she would get a schedule for an early morning opening shift at Starbucks while she was still literally behind the desk, behind the night desk at the hotel. So she wasn't able to, she had to quit the hotel job. She gave up her state subsidized daycare. She had to leave her kids with her mom who had other kids of her own. I mean, it created enormous chaos in her lives, in her life. And this is totally typical. And so what's happening is for, for to save tiny bits on the margins of labor costs, whole workforces are being thrown into this really precarious part-time work. So retail, which has always been low wage, was even eight or ten years ago mainly it was they were real jobs mm -hmm. full-time jobs benefits now they're part-time no benefits much worse jobs than they were even half a dozen years ago how about if you're a telecommuter or a freelancer are you immune from this well no <laughs> um, first of all if you're a telecommuter and you take your company computer home they can look in on you at any time of day. They can see what you're working on. They can see what websites you're visiting. They can see how fast you're typing. They can see what programs you have open. They can see it all. Um, and, and secondly, as with the rise of freelance work, contract work, um, has come the, the rise of these online freelance marketplaces so that people can scour the globe for clients and um, Elance, Odesk, they actually merged, they're now Elance, Odesk, are, are sort of the leading ones. And these firms, what they offer the clients is the ability to do the exact same thing. Um, people who, who want to get guaranteed payment through those companies have to log into a work diary while they're working so the client can look in on their personal computer that they own in their own home at any time. Am I right that you um, used Chipotle in your article as a company that's bucking the trend? Um, well, I, I happen to use Costco. Chipotle would probably work as well. Um, Costco I'm a little more familiar with. Mm -hmm. But yes, it is true that there are uh, thought leaders, you might say, in the retail industry that are, or the fast food industry that are trying to do this differently, that are trying to maximize the number of full-time workers, that are trying to provide stability to their employees' lives. And in fact, if these systems were used with that in mind, they could facilitate that because you now have access to so much data that you really could try to take into account your workers' schedules. These, these systems are powerful enough to do all of that math and design a system that's going to work for your traffic flow, that's going to work for their lives. It just happens not to be the standard practice. You've tried out some of the software yourself, <laughs> right? What did you do? What did it seem like? Well, I did try the Odesk. I, I tried becoming a client on Odesk um, just to see what it was like. I, I spoke to a, a client in that relationship is what? Um, well, I hired someone to do some transcription work for me for the article. I hired a freelancer. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we agreed on a rate. Oh, actually, I mean, what was interesting is when I posted the job, I got um, people offering to do it from all over the world and in many cases for much less than U.S. minimum wage. I mm. went with a, uh, a U.S. employee at a living wage. But, um, but what happened is once she logged in and started to work, I could actually click on every 10 minutes a screenshot was taken of her home computer, and I could see everything on her desktop. I could see what programs she could open. Wow. I actually could see a list of her other clients on the right. I could see her little image that was her screensaver. And I could see the Word doc as the words were filling up. Wow. Yeah. You could see that And much. I got, for each minute, I got a keystroke and a mouse click tally. You couldn't see the content of her Word doc? Yeah, could yeah, you? yeah. You could? Yeah, I could. Wow. So I could read could it as she was doing writing it. Writing it and erasing it and 
Yeah, she was in Texas, I was in Brooklyn, and... And is this all happening because of the globalized workforce? Because freelancers in New York are competing with those in China and Guatemala? I think that's a piece of it. I mean, electronic monitoring really takes off first in call centers back in the 90s, which is the rise of offshoring, right? That was the big first offshoring boom was these remote call centers. And they start putting in these metrics about how many, how many seconds you have to respond to each caller. So guess what happens? I mean, this is what happens with metrics, right? It's the same thing we've seen with teach to the test in the public school system. The people at the call center start hanging up on the callers as soon as they reach their quota. They get a little red light saying they're over time, click. So it didn't exactly do wonders for customer service. And you have to be very careful. I mean, one of the themes that really came out to me was be careful of what you measure. You know, be very careful of what you measure because that's what's going to end up. That's people will perform to that measurement, not to your broader company goals. Right, you're incentivizing to do exactly what they know they're being measured on, so they better be the right metrics. Yeah. Um, reaction to your piece? Have any companies reacted? Well, I was pretty careful to loop them in as I was reporting it. Um, I, you know, I I don't think they're so happy with it. Well, s some of them are are okay with it. I mean, I think that. You take a company like Kronos, which is, is the, one of these scheduling systems that work in retail and fast food, and uh, you know th they have a think tank. They like to consider themselves experts in the retail industry and thought leaders, and they're a little unhappy when it gets when attention is paid to the way their systems are typically used in practice. Um, I think they're beginning to try to work with advocacy groups with some of the labor rights groups and see about actually making some tweaks to their software to allow companies to take into account worker schedules. I mean, that would be a fantastic outcome. Well, thanks for bringing this into wider view. Yeah, thanks for having me. The Mideast is such a tinderbox, Asia is such an economic powerhouse. Those of us without roots in Latin America often fail to give that nearby region full attention. But today we have an opportunity to explore one country that's undergone enormous changes in the past decade, Bolivia. That landlocked nation of 10 million in West Central South America, once the poorest in South America, is currently led by a former leader of the coca growers, Evo Morales. He is the first president to come from the indigenous population, taking office in 2006. Morales' democratic socialist government began to take increasing control of the hydrocarbon industry with those new, uh, and with those new revenues, it has dramatically reduced poverty and illiteracy. But this was no top-down revolution. Morales' election was the culmination of a long grassroots process that began in the streets. To show us that transformation in photographs and bring us up to date on a powerful president who gets criticized from both the right and the left, photojournalist Noah Friedman Rudovsky. He joins us via Skype from La Paz, Bolivia. Noah has spent 14 years in Bolivia, some of those years as Morales' own official photographer. Noah, thanks so much for coming on and sharing your photos with us. Hello from New York. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. And uh, you suggested that we begin with this photo, which we'll put right up, of a miner. Why this one to start? I think it evokes a sense of where this process of social change in Bolivia was born. Uh, the mines have always been at the center of political protests here. And back in 1985, when they were privatized, it set in motion two decades of social upheaval. Um, before 1985, the mines had been nationalized by a revolution back in 1952. And they had always been a powerful symbol of the country's colonial period and their heritage and wealth. Uh, and in 1985, when they were privatized, it was part of a structural adjustment program that was pushed by the Chicago Boys, the, the American economists who were um, at that point advising lots of Latin American nations. And they're mining uh, tin, they're mining gold. Yeah, mostly tin and silver. This one was taken in the silver mines of Potosi, uh, which had made Spain wealthy back in the 1500s. Yeah. That's a great shot. It's so evocative. Let's go on to number two. This is a 2000, year 2000, photo of the water war protest in the town of Cochabamba. Also a protest against privatization. And tell people, because hardly any of our viewers know 
What's a water war? Well, back in 2000, uh, the company Bechtel, a foreign company, tried to privatize Cochabamba's water system. Uh, in fact, there was a famous quote that they were going to privatize even the raindrops uh, because people had been gathering water even from their gutters to use as water uh, for drinking water, and Bechtel wanted to privatize the entire system. Uh, and it became so a wide group of social movements rose up against this privatization scheme, and it became one of these first cases worldwide where a grassroots movement won a victory against a multinational corporation. Uh, and in Bolivia, for these social movements, it instilled this sense of hope and empowerment that there had never really been before. Uh, the leader, Oscar Oliveira, of the Water War once said that it, it showed the possibility of a ray of hope and proof that everything is not predetermined. Let's go right on to the third image. And this person standing between these posters suggests what was going on at the grassroots, does it? Yes. I mean, while pro Protests made a lot of headlines in Bolivia from 2000 to 2005. The real story about what was going on here was much more behind the scenes. Um, in Bolivia's social movements, which were workers' unions, farmers' unions, indigenous organizations, uh, especially coca-growing uh, organizations, they were involved in this very everyday grassroots organizing uh, to build a movement that would counteract their, their limits in the country, very similar to the civil rights movement in the U.S. Um, to demand more of a say in the nation's decision making. And much of it was this daily work of consciousness, consciousness building and organizing. Um, there had been this sense of hegemony in lots of countries in Latin America uh, with this neoliberal economic model, basically trickle down economics. Uh, and what was at work in these meetings was uh, discussions about alternative models and ways that indigenous people could have more say in the government. Uh, so this one was taken in the region in the Chapare where coca growers were organizing especially to have the right to grow coca against the U.S. backed drug war in, the, in Bolivia. Uh, and here in the Chapare was where Evo Morales, who's now president, was the leader of this union. Um, and some of these protests were long marches. And so in this next photo we see... So this is a march uh, from 2004, but basically from 1991 till 2005, there was a series of these very long ma marches, sometimes roadblocks, led by indigenous groups and coca growers that often came from the lowlands of Bolivia, hundreds of, uh, hundreds of miles up to the highlands at 12,000 feet in, in La Paz. Uh, and many of them were led by women, as you can see here, wearing flip-flops for hundreds of miles. Um, and they, when they wrote, when they arrived to the cities, especially La Paz, they, they kind of shocked the middle classes into a new level of awareness about how the rest of society in Bolivia was living. Um, and it, they began to, to gain some sympathy from the middle classes. And also they began to produce some fear about what was to come from middle classes when they started to march into the cities of La Paz. And on this 50th anniversary week of the Selma March in the United States, um, very, very relevant and interesting to see echoes in another country. Um, all right, next shot, indigenous people at a protest. Tell us what and when. So in 2003, um, October of 2003, things in Bolivia reached a breaking point. Uh, the president, Sanchez de Lozada, who had been schooled in the U.S. and spoke Spanish with a, a heavy American accent, made a plan to export the country's natural gas supplies through Chile and out to the U.S. and Mexico. Uh, and the country was just tired of seeing its riches go abroad, as the silver had in the colonial period. And the city of El Alto, which sits right above La Paz, which is a mostly indigenous city, rose up neighborhood by neighborhood to demand that Bolivia's natural gas stop being exported and it be nationalized. Uh, and it was a real grassroots rebellion. Uh, just within a few weeks, uh, the neighborhood started to organize and blocking the roads and squeezing the, the capital city, La Paz, from getting any type of gasoline and food down to the city. Uh, and President Sancho de Lozada called out the army. Uh, 63 people were killed. And it was a major turning point in Bolivia. There had been, up until then, very little political violence in Bolivia. And there was very little tolerance for this type of violence. And at that point, even the middle classes began to demand change. So here is a, a protest in the main plaza in La Paz where uh, indigenous folks are pleading with the Pachamama, the Mother Earth, for a, a peaceful solution. Uh, 
Political um, violence so after, by the police. 63 people killed. Yeah, and so he was overturned. The, he fled the country in a helicopter the second week of October in 2003, and a caretaker government was installed by the vice president with a kind of fragile accord with these social movements to, to keep power for the next couple of years. And this next shot is a photo of a vigil in 2005, and I guess this is right before that previous president, Carlos Mesa, stepped down and promised elections. Yes, exactly. Uh, basically, he had been in power for a year and a half, and at this point, the social movements had lost patience with this political process that was just too slow to incorporate their demands. Um, so here, they're at night, they're blocking off all the intersections that lead to the, the presidential palace and Congress, uh, demanding new elections. Um, and this was one of these moments where Bolivia seemed on the edge of a civil war. Uh, things could have gone either way. It felt at some times at night like that, that things were if the government called out the army again, that this country was going to turn into a, a bloody mess. Um, but luckily, at each moment, both the social movements and the governments, to their credit, pulled back from, from so much violence. Bef uh, Before ahead. we move on to the next image, it's an incredible story with drama and democracy at stake and people's livelihoods at stake in the economy and people getting killed in protests and changes of power. We were hardly hearing anything about this at all in the United States. Yeah, it was, it, there were some very dramatic moments uh, and, and, some, and very unique moments. Like at this roadblock, I remember there was a woman, Leonilda Sorita, who is kind of in charge of the roadblock, who later told me that what she was thinking at that moment was, and quote, she said, and now what? Let's see if we're going to win these next elections. But if we win, what are we going to propose? It was really kind of unprecedented what was happening, yeah. that these social movements led by indigenous folks were at the tip of gaining power. Well, did they win? Because the next shot looks like indigenous people in the halls of power, physically. Well, this is still uh, 2005 when they're calling, waiting for new elections. You know, parallel to these marches and the struggle in the streets, they had been making inroads uh, in ele with electoral politics in 2005. And so these were a group of indigenous legislatures who had been in Congress for three years, and they had seized the seats of the leaders of Congress, who you could see in front of them, trying to decide what to do uh, as they negotiated for new elections. And the presidential election is called in 2005. Evo Morales quickly becomes the leading candidate. And what are we seeing on this beautiful landscape? So this is the, the high plains in Bolivia, these plains that are above 13,000 feet, uh, predominantly Aymara in the countryside, which is also where Evo Morales was born. Um, so basically he took his campaign to the, mostly the rural areas for three months, uh, and it was just this outburst of enthusiasm among indigenous folks who finally felt they had a chance for their, their voice to be heard within the system. The hills are alive with the sound of democratic socialism. And in this next shot... He has won? Yes, so everyone has won with this shocking 54% of the vote. Nobody in Bolivia had gained more than 35% of the presidential vote uh, since democracy in 1980. Uh, so he won with kind of a wide coalition of not just indigenous groups, but middle classes as well. Uh, when he took over, he made this very moving speech uh, when he said that they were here to say enough to 500 years of resistance and moving on to 500 years of taking power as indigenous folks. Uh, and so they started to build this government with people who had very little experience in governing, mostly indigenous uh, union leaders, leftist intellectuals, trying to figure out how to take this state apparatus and, and make it work for them. Next shot is Evo Morales visiting a local community. What's the context here? So here, yeah, basically on a daily basis as president, uh, he makes these visits to local communities, often giving uh, infrastructure projects, uh, working on illiteracy projects. Uh, and his, his approval ratings have remained remarkably high as president. He's been president now for nine years, uh, and he, approval ratings still stay above, at this point, 70%. Um, most of his force is still in the countryside with poor farmers and the indigenous. Uh, 
but there's also a lot of support from middle class because the economy has been very strong. Uh, there's certainly a lot of folks, uh, uh, more radical folks, who expected more and have been disappointed. Um, in part of the social movements who, who brought them to power, there are people who have broken out of the coalition uh, who expected more of a revolution. But at this point, he's been governing for nine years, and the, the country has seen a real peaceful transformation. And in this country, if we ever hear of Evo Morales, it's usually in the context of, oh, he's one of the radical socialist leaders of Latin America in a block with uh, former Hugo Chavez and the Castros. Yeah, I think a lot of his rhetoric, especially internationally, is quite uh, radical and anti-imperialist, and so he's and he's certainly made strong alliances with Venezuela and Nicaragua and Cuba. But the truth is, at home in Bolivia, uh, he's had a lot of programs that fund things for the poor, but he's actually been pretty conservative macroeconomically. Um, they've avoided inflation and overspending and a lot of the traps of, that the left has fallen into before in Latin America. But there is some unity, as I think this next image indicates. Yes, yeah, so there's certainly been a lot of conflicts in the early years of the Evo Morales um, presidency, but there's also seen this kind of reordering, reordering of society. And you would have never seen before this march, for example, that was on a military day parade where you had military folks marching with um, who are called the Red Ponchos, which are kind of one of the more radical groups of Aymara peasants in Bolivia who had led many of the anti-government protests for years. Uh, and so here they're marching together at a, at a yearly military day parade uh, saluting the president together. So if the past has been tin mining and gold mining and silver mining, the future might be extraction of lithium. Let's look at this next photo. Lithium might be an ingredient that powers electric cars to replace gasoline-powered cars. What are we seeing here? Yeah, this has actually been one of the few things that Bolivia has gotten a lot of attention from internationally. They have uh, the half of the world's lithium supplies uh, sitting under this amazing landscape in the Solar de Uyuni, uh, the Uyuni salt flats. And their idea, they've rejected a lot of uh, offers from international consortiums offering to, ex to exploit and export their lithium, and they are dead set on, on not doing it with foreign companies and making it a, a government project. Um, the progress has been slow. They started in 2008, but they're now exporting small amounts of lithium for the first time. Uh, and it, it's kind of, it's a very, it's a banner project for the Evo Malaz government. It's something that says, you know, we're going to reverse this um, course of the past of exporting uh, silver and gas and making foreigners rich and we're gonna do this ourselves. Their idea is that they would like not to just export the mineral itself but to make the batteries or, or if they could the, even the electric cars in Bolivia. So the future, final shot, young man, shows us it's not just economics, it's emotion and spirit and feeling. Yes, this was a, a, an Aymara rapper um, who blends hip hop from abroad and, and with his Aymara language here in Bolivia. And I think it illustrates what will be one of the lasting and most important changes in Bolivia from Evo Morales. For all the criticisms that, could, that there could be from either side about how much he has accomplished, there's no doubt that what he has accomplished and that what will be lasting in Bolivia is a change of identity and pride among indigenous people and their role in, in society and in the government. Um, Part of his lyrics uh, by Abraham Bohorquez, this artist, said, um, I am proud to have been born the product of alcohol, the coca, the mother earth, and to be the son of a miner, a peasant, a factory worker. I am proud of that man. I'm Indian, and so what? Uh, so I think it speaks a lot to the sense of indigenous pride and, and change that they've been able to instill. All right, we have a minute left. We'll put up a bonus shot. Tell us what we're looking at. Uh, so this is, I think, also speaks to this sense of uh, the grassroots here and the social movements continuing to march. You know, this has been a process that started in the streets and, and transitioned to the palace and has been kind of a bottom-up and top-down process of social change. And I think this photo illustrates a bit that, you know, as much as um, 
the change right now is concentrated in the halls of power, that there's still folks organizing and social groups pressuring for, for what, what they need. Bolivia, a country with such different cultural and political and economic questions than the United States. Viewers, now you know a little bit more about it. I, I heard that you showed these uh, shots, many of them at the United Nations, and President Morales called you his gringo photographer. <laughs> yeah, we did an exhibit at the UN uh, uh, with Funky Moon and Eva Morales there. And yes, it's been, you know, it was very strange as, a, as an American at times to be working for a president who's seen as, as anti-American in the press. But the truth is the experience was always uh, lively and uh, really smooth. <laughs> Thanks very much for sharing your images with us and your words. Thanks for having me. Time for Public Intellectual, where we look at new research with the power to change minds and public policy. Humorist and political commentator Jim Hightower once wrote a book called If the Gods Had Meant for Us to Vote, They Would Have Given Us Candidates. Jim was thinking about the low quality of the offerings. But in fact, we may be facing a true candidate shortage. New data suggests there is a lack of new faces in politics because young people are reluctant to run. How come? Survey answers point to polarization of politics, the role of big money, and the fear of losing one's privacy. With us via Skype to share her research, Shauna Shamas, professor of political science at Rutgers University. Hi, welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. What research question were you trying to answer? I first looked at why more women and people of color did not seem to want to run for office. And as I began this research, I realized the question was actually much larger. The question was, why don't most people want to run for office? It expanded beyond the gender and race parameters I started with. And what, um, how did you set, to find out, set out to find out? So I looked at the people I thought would be most likely to want to run, the people that had already chosen a career in law or policy and were enrolled in law or policy graduate schools. Uh, and I looked particularly at those that are most likely to send people into political office. So national political office, it was schools at Harvard University. So I looked at Harvard Law School and Harvard's Kennedy School. And uh, since I was in Massachusetts, I looked at the Massachusetts State Legislature. And the school that's most likely to send uh, legislators there is Suffolk Law School. So those are the schools where I conducted my research. Your sample was 750 law and policy students? Right. Uh, it's a, a about two to 300 from each school. Uh, and more of them are from Harvard Law School uh, because I was also trying to collect racial data and that had the highest level of racial diversity. And what kinds of questions did you ask them on this survey? Because it's pretty much self-reported, right? Uh, sure. It's, it's self-reported in that uh, I asked a, a huge number of questions. I also paid people to take the survey so that I got hopefully a more representative sample than just people who were already interested in politics. So I gave uh, everybody who took the survey got $10 for a 15-minute survey. A 15-minute survey is significant. That gives us a lot of data. That is a lot of time to ask people questions. Uh, so let's put up a few graphics that show your work. Number one uh, basically reflects, I guess, your, um, your sample. This is Tell the demographics what, of the sample. Of the sample. So right. um, white males, 34%, females, 27% and so many fewer blacks, Hispanic, and Asian. So that reflects who's in these schools of law and public policy? Uh, yes, unfortunately, uh, although it's a slight undersample of Asian who uh, are more of a percentage than that of the, the law school. And it's uh, a good proportion of black and Hispanic in terms of who's actually there. Uh, so less than 10% of the schools that I looked at were of those groups. And now we'll put up a slide 
showing results, those who've thought of running for office, explain the numbers here. Okay, so the first thing you should know is this is uh, both by uh, race and by gender. So if you want to look just first at the lighter bars, those are the men. Uh, and what you can see is that this is more of a gender story than a racial story. So uh, men in all racial groups are more interested in running for office than the women of those groups. There's a little bit of a, a racial story, particularly for uh, men, in that the men of color were slightly more likely than white men in running, um, whereas women of color are uh, not as interested in running for office. Uh, and particularly Hispanic and Asian women were least likely in run, uh, least likely to say they wanted to run. And do the survey responses indicate why? They do, yeah. <laughs> I asked a number of questions about what would you like or not like about running for office. Uh, and I was kind of surprised at the vehemence of what people would not like. They, they didn't like most of the current setup about how people run in terms of the way that people raise money, uh, the way that you get people to support you, uh, and particularly in terms of media coverage and uh, party gatekeeping. They had a lot of anticipation and um, negative associations uh, with what it takes to be a candidate. But it was really scaring off women more than men, these particular barriers. It, it, these barriers scared off women more than men, uh, but also so the women saw more barriers. So if you add in discrimination or expected discrimination as a cost, the women expected that far more than the men did. Uh, and that too scared them off. It, scared off suggests that they were deterred irrationally. I'd say they were pretty rationally deterred. They just didn't think they'd get a fair shake. Were they apathetic politically or they just didn't want to pursue their political interests and values as candidates? This is not an apathetic sample. This is a highly participatory sample, more so than the general population. But it's also not a sample that wanted to put their own hats into the ring. A lot of them thought they could do more good on the outside through uh, agitator groups or NGOs. This is just a sample of millennials, people who are in college or policy or law school right now. Uh, so do you have any basis of comparison with the past? A little bit. Uh, I didn't myself survey people prior to this, but I've looked at other people's surveys. So Gallup, Pew, uh, both study young people. And then in particular, I've looked at the, the Harvard IOP youth politics survey. Uh, and there's a clear trend of kind of decreasing trust in government that uh, kind of mirrored what I found in my sample, which was not over time. Mine was just a one point in time. But because I found something so similar, uh, I felt reasonably confident in claiming that this might be a larger uh, both group trend and pattern. Here's another interesting finding of yours in a graphic, and it's about who identifies strongly with political parties. What are we seeing here? So I split my sample into thirds. The first third I called the low political ambition group, uh, and that was the, the people who did not have any interest in running for office. So what you see here is the lowest, those with the lowest ambition and those with the highest ambition. And it's uh, along this one variable I called party fit, as in, do you feel like you fit into one of the two major parties? So what this suggests is that those with a strong party fit were far more likely to also be in the high political ambition category. But that just makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, it does make sense, but it also tells us who we're leaving out as, as kind of potential political players now. It, it, it makes a lot of sense for... Everything I found makes sense for those who would or would not want to be potential candidates. Right. If you strongly identify with a political party, then you're more likely to be politically ambitious and of maybe course. vice versa. But then maybe there's some, something to be learned about uh, the large number of people who now identify with neither party. Is that part of the point here? So in my interviews particularly, what I found is that people would constantly say to me, 
well, I'm a fiscal conservative, but it's socially liberal, and I don't feel like I could get elected with my combination of views. Uh, and Rand it, Paul? It's, a, it's a shame. It's a loss to all of us when people who would be good candidates don't feel like there's any space for them. So uh, in 10 years, are we going to have um, Clinton versus Bush again, maybe Chelsea against uh, Jeb's daughter or something like that? I don't know. I mean, given what I found in the survey about young people's aversion to the the kind of constant media surveillance, uh, I don't think these these young people who grew up in the limelight want any more of it. And I don't blame them. Well, very interesting. Very instructive. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. And that's public intellectual for this week. Coming up next after a break, a unique film series. Immigrant women make their voices heard. We'll see clips. It's a unique film series, and it runs through June. The Entertainment Industry Association New York, Women in Film and Television, is producing a series showcasing the work of immigrant and first-generation American filmmakers. It's entitled Immigrant Women Sharing Our Voices Through Film. Some great films in this. Joining us, two filmmakers, Zeta Parani, produced and directed the award-winning documentary short, Judith, Portrait of a Street Vendor. Christine Miladic Jani is a Brooklyn-based filmmaker involved with outreach to the community that speaks the language Quechua. She directed the documentary short, Living Quechua. We'll, we'll see samples of both. Welcome both of you to, to our program. And Zaidi, you want to set up uh, this one-minute excerpt that we're going to show of your film, Judith about a street vendor? Yeah, sure. So the film is called Judith Portrait of a Street Vendor, and it's basically um, a day in the life of an immigrant street vendor from Guatemala living and working in New York City. And, um, you know, she's here to pursue the American dream, but she's also a community organizer in her own community working for the rights of street vendors. All right, let's take a look. A minute of Judith Portrait of a Street Vendor. <laughs> Well, tell us first about that scene. Was that here in New York? Yes, this, uh, the entire film takes place in New York. Um, and that last scene is uh, her with her uh, fellow street vendors with an organization called Vamos Unidos. Vamos Unidos is a worker center based here in New York City that organizes street vendors. Where and what does she sell? Uh, Judith sells uh, freshly cooked Guatemalan foods, everything from breakfast to lunch. Uh, and she basically goes around to workplaces um, in industrial areas and sells her food fresh to workers. Where there would be a fair number of workers of Central American background who might want that particular food. Absolutely. Some of the men I actually spoke to were saying this it's such a treat because they're so far removed from most places to eat. Um, again, these are in industrial areas. And they were just so happy whenever they would see uh, Judith and her, uh, her, the women she works with, come by with fresh-made Guatema Guatemalan food, and it was such a treat every day for the men. But it's not just her personal work, but also political work, it seems like, that she thinks is going to get her daughter ahead. Absolutely. I mean, it's the basic story of the American dream, and Judith talks about in the film how she came here and she works so hard, um, as a businesswoman, actually, to get her daughters out of the same cycle that she lives in of um, being low income, being undocumented, um, and that's her dream is for her daughters to have a better life. So what's the protest asking for 
in that case because there's no employer paying her the wages to sell her food products, right? Absolutely. So what Judith and her uh, street vendors that she works with are asking for is immigration reform. Uh, and so this film was actually shot in the first term of President Obama. And the scene that you see in the film and in this trailer is actually within his first year. Um, he had be been elected on the promise of getting immigration reform for people. And so part of her ask is to have that so that she can have that for herself and her kids. Christine, set up your film for us. Sure. I made Living Quechua to highlight the important work that Elva Ambiarebata is doing to help Quechua languages here in New York City and to connect Quechua speakers. Who is Elva? Elva came from Peru as a teenager to Brooklyn, so she's lived here for over 50 years. But in order to work and provide for her children to survive, she really needed to prioritize and learn English. She put Spanish behind that and Quechua behind that. However, Quechua is often talked about because it's an endangered language according to UNESCO. Um, so Elva, really in this film, you can see she's trying to help inspire people to feel proud of speaking Quechua so that it can stay alive. So here's about a minute of living Quechua. Cuando llegué a Estados Unidos, por mucho tiempo no hablaba el quechua. Pero si no practicamos el quechua, se puede desaparecer. So are you of a background that speaks Quechua? I'm not. However, um, when I was 11 years old, my parents adopted two Peruvian children into my family. And it kind of opened my eyes at a young age to thinking about, you know, what circumstances led to this adoption and where they came from. So I've been kind of on this lifelong journey to understand a little bit more of these larger questions. So is this about culture? Is this about people trying to make it in New York or wherever? Or is this about a language and preserving the language? Well, language is complicated like that. It's wrapped up into people's identities, into feelings of home, into, you know, ancestral knowledge, questions of heritage. So I think when a language is at stake, there's a lot that's at stake. Spoken like the anthropologist that I think you are, right? <laughs> um, is there a movement to save Quechua in Peru? Because it's not the majority language there either. It's interesting. You know, estimates of Quechua speakers in the Andes range from 7 to 12 million speakers. Um, however, historically, the languages have been stigmatized. Quechua speakers have faced severe discrimination. It's a, it's a challenging situation to be in for a Quechua speaker. Why would they have faced discrimination? Who would discriminate on the basis of language in Peru? For what reason? Um, well, through colonialism and the Republican era, many different historical processes took place that cast Quechua in a negative light. It associated Quechua languages and speakers with something traditional as opposed to modern, um, as an obstacle to uniting the nation, um, Quechua wasn't always written down. So anyways, these, there's a lot to overcome in, think, in trying to cast Quechua in a positive light. Did you know each other before this show? No, Have you met? we don't. No. Did you see each other's films? Yes, we, we met through the, act, the film series, actually. Mm -hmm. what, uh, what do you think you share? I mean, I think for us, it's that sharing that unique perspective with the world on, um, on these unique voices that are out there and incredible women who have come to this country 
you know, under different circumstances, um, really trying to do something different and trying to make the world a better place, even in the country where they were not born. Same question. Yeah, I think that, you know, at the, the first night of the film series, there were three films there, and we all, the filmmakers were there, all with the women that are featured in our films. And it was an eye-opening experience for everyone to see just how much we all share. Um, I just want to make sure that people know where they can see subsequent films in this series, which runs through June. Your films have actually shown already, right? You're yes. done. Yes. <laughs> um, the series continues through the month of June. The next event is Monday, March 30th at the Knockdown Center in Maspeth. That's in Queens. The theme will be fiction shorts featuring the works of several filmmakers. Um, what are you looking forward to in the series? Anything you know of? Or just... Looking to be I'll surprised. Just, yeah, any film. I'm looking forward to see some, seeing some fiction films because my own background's in documentary. So to see how the stories of immigrant women are told through fiction is will be interesting. And Maspeth is this a new uh, arts uh, artist neighborhood in, in in New York now? Maybe we're breaking new ground. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, I think it's really it's it's pretty amazing that the film series takes place in Queens. I think because it's about immigrant women. And if any place, it's Queens that is one of the most diverse areas in the world. So it's probably the perfect place to have a film series like this. How was the reaction to your film? I was very happy that it was positively received. It's been shown at a lot of festivals. We've also been reaching out in the community. There are lots of Quechua and Quechua speakers in New York City. It's estimated that there are thousands of them. And so it's been really amazing to to meet them and to show the film and have a dialogue around these issues. And your film about the Street Fender won an award, right? Yeah, it won Best Documentary Short at the Workers Unite Film Festival. Congratulations. Thank you. On your films and on the series, and thank you for joining us. Thank, thank you, you so much. And that's our program for today. We're here each week at this hour, and each weekday from 10 a.m. to noon, you can find me on Public Radio, WNYC, 93.9 FM, and AM 820. I'm Brian Lehrer. Thanks for watching.